postcard there in front of you looks something like this. And so if you fill that out, uh, that would help us tremendously on how to pray. Uh, and, uh, we'll get you on a prayer list, on one call list. And, uh, and uh, at the end of the service, I'll be out back there. You can just hand that to me. I can kind of put a name to the face. And I appreciate that a whole bunch. And so thank you for that. And again, we have a few announcements uh, this morning. Uh, remember this night, uh, it's 5.45 p.m., uh, We'll be leaving for Oak Haven over there at our nursing home, and the plans will be leaving at 545, so come on out if you'd like to be a part of that or go over there and minister to those folks. Of course, we'll be having a service here, but we'll have a good crowd that goes over there, and that's a blessing for our church and for the people that are doing that. We appreciate it so much, and I know those folks really appreciate it. Also, just a reminder about our Sunday school or Wednesday night Bible study, come on out for those. It's a good way to grow in the Lord. Growing the Lord by getting in His Word. That'll help you. And so get in His Word, come and study with us, and uh, Lord honor that and He'll bless that. Also, this Sunday is our fifth Sunday night. This coming Sunday, not tonight, but this coming Sunday, June the 30th, the fifth Sunday night singing. And so there's a sign up sheet back there, so go ahead and sign up if you like to sing, or uh, you play the washboard, or the spoons, and you carry a tongue for that. Come on. Do all to the glory of no king, not you. The only place I've seen is in the shower. Sing it, well, you won't be singing here, son. Anyway, but anybody else, sign right up. But anyway, come on out. And uh, today at 4.30 p.m., we have our choir practice. And uh, come on out for that. And uh, this Wednesday, uh, we'll be leaving at 7 uh, a.m. Uh, for West Virginia on our mission trip. We'll be back. Saturday, and so just come on out for that, and then it's Wednesday at 7 a.m., uh, June 26th to the 29th, and we'll be going up to our one of our missionaries to support, and uh, be helping out in the print, printing uh, room, he, he prints tracts and gleaning in Christ ministries to support them, that's Brother John Davis, and so if you'd like to go on that, uh, just show up and uh, bring you some change of clothes and all that good stuff, or you can see me uh, this, uh, today or anytime time grab hold of them and, and just talk to me about it if you'd like to come and be with us. Uh, also, we we'll have our uh, business meeting Wednesday, July the 3rd. Uh, let's see, July 7th, the women's ministry is going to meet. And then, of course, we have a sign-up sheet for BBS. And so if you'd like to help any way you feel like the Lord's leading, just sign up back there to help with our vacation Bible school. And we're looking forward to that. And then we have some other announcements, uh, upcoming dates and, and things that are going on this year. You can look down there and see that. So a lot of stuff going on. And so we just appreciate uh, your prayers about that stuff. And appreciate you coming in and, and helping and working with us. And, and uh, just serving the Lord together. That's really what it's all about. And it's just a blessing to do that. So we appreciate all those uh, opportunities that the Lord has given us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you. You've been so good to us. Lord, you've been able to just do so many things, Lord. We just want to do more for you. And God, I pray you just kind of move in our service today, Lord Father. I, I know I need you in here in the midst of this thing, Lord Father. I need a touch from an anointing, Lord. We preach, open my heart up to the Word, Lord Father. I pray you open all our hearts up to it. God, you do something in our, in our midst, Lord Father, something that's miraculous, supernatural. God, you move in a mighty way, not. Not just any emotion, but down in the deepest part of man, Lord Father, is the work that we need you to do this morning. So we just praise you and thank you for what you're going to do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you go ahead and uh, grab your hymn book, please, while you stand, and turn to page 139. When I see the blood, boy, that's a good song to start off on. When I see the blood, thank you for the blood. Number 139.
Because if I ain't have no Nosferatu one, I said, no, they don't have one, but you've got one. <laughs>
get singing. Mm-hmm. So we'll go ahead and dismiss this morning for our children's church. <laughs> and our nursery. Yeah. Children's church ages three to six, and our nursery's back there.
he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou have comest to anoint Haziel to be king of Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nishai, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shabbat, of Abel Mahola, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Let's pray. Lord, I pray you'd help me. God, you give me some unction and anointing this morning. God, you'd open my mouth, fill it with thy words. God, I pray you'd open all our hearts, Lord Father, what you have to say to us this morning, Lord Father. I pray, Lord Father, you'd encourage the brethren, Lord Father, that you'd rebuke, reprove, instruct us in all righteousness, Lord Father, that we might be more like you. God, I pray you'd put a hedge around us for the next little bit, Lord Father, that we could just focus. Keep our hearts set on you, Lord Father, for the next little bit, Lord Father. And I pray you just work and do what only you can do, Lord Father, this morning. Let's change a life, Lord Father, and save a soul. And we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you didn't know anything at all about your Old Testament, certainly you've heard of this man, Elijah, one of the most famous men, an extraordinary man, a courageous, fearless, perhaps not a man like him, that we really could compare anyone else to. He had an extraordinary life. In chapter 17, he pops on the scene, the Tishbite, they call him, and he fearlessly condemns sin before King Ahab and Jezebel and the people of Israel. He's miraculously kept and fed by the ravens at a brook called Cherith in chapter 17. He raised the widow's son back to life in chapter 17. He was a man of prayer. He had the very ear of God. And when he prayed that it wouldn't rain, his prayer shut the heavens up for three and a half years. There's a man with power with God. There's a man who knew something about prayer. There's a man that walked step in step with his God. What a prayer life. What power. What purpose this man had. When I think about his life, it's almost unbelievable when you read all the things that he accomplished for God. It's an amazing resume to say the least. In chapter 18, we find him on the top of Mount Carmel before 450 of Baal's prophets. He's mocking them. He's calling the fire of God down upon the altar. The place of victory. The place of testimony is where he was at. Carmel means fruitful. It means plentiful. And by himself, when nobody would do it, he stood against evil in his day. What a man. The chapter uh, before this, chapter 18, finishes with this verse. In verse 46, the Bible tells us, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. The hand of God on this man. Can you imagine what this man must have been like? I think about it often uh, when I read about him there in 1 Kings. and He would go on to do even greater things. and uh, He would anoint Elisha, he would again, he would anoint Hazael and Jehu and uh, at the end of his life when death uh, would take over all others, he was just taken to heaven in a whirlwind. Imagine that. Amen. Never even tasted of death. What an extraordinary man. I dare say there's not a resume uh, that I know of that could stand on that, that could compare to that. I think of my resume. And I'm ashamed of it. I mean, what a man of God he was. And it makes all that we just read in chapter 19 that much more unusual, doesn't it? I mean, think about what we just read about this man, this great, godly, effectual, powerful, praying man in chapter 19. Surely this is the chapter that James had in mind uh, when we read about him in the New Testament. James in his epistle says, Eliza 
Elijah was a man subject to like passions. He was just a man, wasn't he? Uh, from all that uh, we read about him, he seems almost superhuman, and yet he was just a man. And even, as the old saying goes, even the best of men at their best are just men, aren't they? The question that raises me, uh, that I raised to you, that was raised to me this week as I read that, 18, chapter 19, what happens when the fire goes out? What happens in your life when the fire goes out? What do you do when uh, the fire turns into ashes? Because every fire leaves ashes, doesn't it? Every mountaintop is followed by a valley. Every sunny day is followed by a dark night. I'd like to think that we'd always be on top of the mountain. I'd like to think that we'd never fail God. I'd like to think that it would all be big and extravagant and uh, we'd live in the mountain of testimony and blessing and power. But we just know that's not true. Right? If you walk with Christ any time at all, if you walk with the Lord uh, for a little bit, you realize that uh, there's probably more valleys than mountaintops. I mean, there's probably more uh, days when you just have to kind of grind it out, for lack of a better word. When it's nothing spectacular, it's just the day-to-day -day stuff. When the fire goes out. Elijah found that out. And I believe the Lord put this in the record of the Holy Scripture to help us, give us some practical lessons on our life when the fire goes out. There's going to be juniper trees to get up under and lay down to sleep. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is just go to sleep. Take a nap. There's going to be some wilderness wandering. Some long times, 40 days and 40 nights, it says, as we read there, that Elijah went in the wilderness. There's going to be some wilderness in our life. There's going to be some caves in our life. Like Elijah, he went into the cave and said, I'll just get away from the world and I'll just hide in this cave and wait for something to happen. There'll be some caves in our lives. We just want to stick our head in the sand and just kind of disappear, get away. Elijah had come to the point where he hit the wall. Have you ever done that? You ever just hit the wall? I mean, you just you you had it. I mean, you're finished. I can't go anymore for the Lord. I can't do this anymore. I I just can't even get up and, and have another day of work. I don't believe I can do it anymore. I've hit the wall. I think it's time for me just to quit find a juniper tree and lay down under and wallow a little bit in my pity party. Now I know that may be strange to you because you probably never had a pity party. <laughs> I know I have and I've heard about it. <coughs> yeah, right there. There's going to be times like that when the fires of Mount Carmel are going to die out and you're going to uh, come down off that high and there's going to be a valley that you're going to have to walk through. What are you going to do when the fire goes out? What are you going to do? Let's look at what happened to Elijah and take some practical lessons from when the fire that goes out. And let me just say this. It's often immediately after a great victory and a time of blessing like Elijah had that you'll hit the wall. You ever notice that? Yeah. Anytime I see something big or a part of something big, or see the Lord blessing and moving in my life, I realize that I am a target for Satan and for his attacks. Right. And usually he attacks the hardest after our greatest victories. It's odd that you see Jezebel, and you don't see that name much anymore, do you? That's a joke. I don't know why his name that. <laughs> Jezebel and Ahab, you would think, that after they suffered a defeat like they def was defeated on Mount Carmel, you think they would have quit. But they didn't quit. Wickedness and the devil, they don't quit. Right. Listen, when they get beat and lose, you know what they do? They're the opposite of Christians. They double down and they get mean and they get nasty and they attack hard. Yeah. Listen, when the Christian loses, man, he, he just goes all the things he can't take much. He's soft. But your adversary of the devil is like a roaring lion. And after a great victory, he often attacks with his hardest efforts. He just doubles down. He keeps fighting. And Satan often uses the very characteristic 
the very trait that is strongest in your life to attack you with. You ever notice that? I have in my own life. I hope you're not one of those foolish people that uh, thinks he's such a rock that he would never, you know, you hear that person, well, I would never do that. You hear people say that. Oh, I would never look at another woman. I'm like a rock. I'm so strong. That would never be something I have to worry about and guard myself against. That's the very fool that says that. Isn't it? Oh, I'd never lie or, or, or cheat on my money or on my taxes and stuff. I'd never do that kind of thing. I've got, I'm a man of integrity. I don't have to even worry about that. That's exactly the very things that you are strongest at that Satan awful attacks you with that very trait that you have. We get off guard and say we don't worry about that part of our life because we think we're secure in that. And it's the very thing that Satan attacks. It's all through Scripture. What's Abraham faithful? I mean, what's he uh, well known for? I already told you. His faith, right? He's the father of faith. I mean, he's the father of all faith. He's the friend of God. And the very faith that he had, like nobody else had ever had before, uh, when a little famine came along in the book of Genesis, uh, he went where? He went down into Egypt where God told him not to go. The very thing he was the strongest at became the attack of Satan, the temptation of Satan, and he failed miserably. He even went down there and told Sarah, sweet Sarah, he said, just tell them you're my sister so they won't kill me and take you. Man, that's about low down, isn't it? Man, if I just say that about Jamie, man, she killed me. Before I, they wouldn't have a chance to kill me. She killed me. How about King David's greatest quality? He was a man of integrity. Remember when he caught Saul right there in the cave? There, and he, he could have killed Saul two or three times. And, and he said, I'll not touch and put my hand on King Saul uh, because he's God's anointed. And what integrity and what honesty uh, that David had like no other king that ever lived before him. Yet there he was on top of his roof one day and he looks out and he sees Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he became a lying, scheming murderer. Right? <laughs> Instead of a man of integrity. And the Bible says he had a, the heart of God on him, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Think about that. And that's where Satan attacks us in our, often in our strongest Traits. It was Elijah that was courageous. He was fearless. There was not a man that ever showed up on the scene like him. He defeated 450 men there on the top of Mount Carmel. He mocked them. He joked around. He called fire down from heaven. He had the hand of God on him. And when one message from one Jezebel came, fear ripped a hold of him and he ran for his life. It almost seems unbelievable if we're looking for it, that it's recorded for us in the Holy Scripture. And he'll do that to you, friend. Moses, the Bible says his greatest trait, his greatest character, if you will, is that he was the meekest man that ever lived. You know what meekness is? It's having all your faculties, all your power under control. He never lost his cool. He never got one-sided. He never got out of the way. But the Bible said he had a fit of anger when he seen an Egyptian beating his brother and he jumped down and he killed the man with his bare hands. And he had to flee from Egypt for 40 years. How about the Apostle Peter? You ever thought about him? Was there ever a man that was more faithful to his Lord and Savior while he walked this earth than Peter? I think not. It was Peter that when they asked, who do you say that I am? He said, man, you're the Son of God. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. In fact, he was so brave that when they come to get Jesus and everybody else fled and ran, he pulled out his pocket knife, his old case, double X. <laughs> <laughs> Off with Malchus' ear, the high priest servant. Remember that? And yet, <laughs> later on that night, he denied Christ. He even cursed the day that he knew it. Friend, we ought to be careful. We think we stand without a fear unless we fall. <coughs> fear gripped the hole when the fire died out. 
not only did fear grip a hold of them, but fatigue after that great victory jumped on their lives. The work of the Lord can be exhausting. You ever notice that? The work of the Lord can be exhausting. Elijah had hit the wall. As I said, he was spent. The Bible says he lay and slept under a juniper tree. He was physically wore out from doing the work of the Lord. Vance Havner quoted when Jesus, you remember Jesus told the disciples there in Mark 6, He said, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Even Jesus realized that the disciples were getting weary. Vance Havner, I like what he used to always say. He said, Listen, if we don't come apart and rest, we will come apart. And that's so true. And, and so physically, uh, when the fire dies out, we, be, can't, we get exhausted. We don't look after ourselves physically or mentally. Uh, we don't take time to rest, to, uh, to take a nap. And, and that's not a problem I have, but it's a lot of problem other people have. But we need to watch after ourselves physically. We don't need to get uh, so exhausted that the devil might jump on us. And use that exhaustion physically. Do you know your physical has an effect on your mental? Sure it does. And this is what was going on, I believe, uh, in Elijah's life. And may I, may, may I offer this uh, little commentary on this? Do you notice uh, how, in this chapter 19, did you notice how isolated Elijah was becoming during this, this chapter? Uh, he had the people of God there on Mount Carmel cheering him on. He flees and runs ahead of Ahab to, Mount, uh, to Jezreel. But then we see him in fear. He leaves there and he takes his servant with him and they go out into the wilderness. But then when they get out in the wilderness, he even leaves his servant and goes out a day's journey from his servant. Then later we find that he takes 40 days and 40 nights by himself in the wilderness and then at the end of the chapter, we see him hiding in a cave totally and completely by himself. He'd isolated himself. You ever see people do that? They come across hard times. They come across difficulties in their life. And instead of uh, uh, banding together with other people of God, uh, with the brethren of God, they begin to isolate themselves. Uh, they begin to spend time by themselves all alone brooding and thinking about the problems of their life and they close everybody out like Elijah did. And I want to tell you, that's a dangerous thing for the Christian to do. You were made to be in the body. You were made to function with other Christians. You were made that way. You're not on some island by yourself. You're not some hero that can do it all by yourself. Listen, you need God first and foremost, but God put other people in the body here for you, and when you isolate yourself, you become despondent, you become distant, you become apathetic, and you become, uh, uh, you brood about your problems all by yourself, and you end up just like Elijah in a dark, dark cave, in a dark, dark place. You're not made to be isolated. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Is what the Bible tells us to do. Why is that? So we can worship corporately, but also because of the help that we gather and we gain from other people. We ought to be weeping when others weep and rejoicing when others rejoice. And that's the body. And we need to have a healthy body. And the healthy body is healthy when everyone is participating in the body. And Elijah said, I'm just checking out. That's what happens, you know. I, maybe you've never seen this, but I have a few times. Tragedy hits. The blessings stop. Someone's walking through the valley. And the first thing they do is they just start isolating themselves. They quit coming to church. They quit singing in the choir. They keep serving. They stop serving. It's a dangerous place. You get this I'm the only one mentality. You notice how he got that, didn't you? When God asked him, what are you doing here? Where are you at? Why are you here? He said, oh, I've been very jealous. I and I alone and of all this land of God's people. That wasn't the case at all, though, was it? But he thought it was because he isolated himself. And then when the fire died out, Elijah became frustrated, didn't he? read that? It says in verse 4 that 
uh, oh Lord, take away my life, for I know better than my father. How could a man with this kind of resume consider himself a failure? I mean, it's one of the greatest men, arguably, that ever walked the face of the earth. And yet he was beating himself up. He said, I'm no better than my fathers. I'm a complete and utter failure. Think about that. We get like that, though, don't we? Uh, we look at our life and we're, we're wanting the bigger, uh, the better. Uh, we want more blessings, more mountaintop experiences. And when, the, when our expectations from God aren't met, uh, when our uh, uh, expectations aren't fulfilled from God, we get depressed about the whole thing. And we do that all the time in our life. And Elijah's doing it right here. Maybe he said, you know what, if I win at Mount Carmel and I, I defeat the prophets of Baal, surely Ahab and Jezebel will repent and turn to God. Certainly the people will rise up and take back their nations. And this is exactly what I want God to do in my life. And when God, listen, when it didn't happen and it didn't meet His expectations, when the results didn't come out like He thought they were, He got depressed about the whole thing. And He got frustrated. He considered himself a failure. He became disgruntled. Charles Stanley used to say, Obey God and let Him handle all the results. And that's a good lesson for you and I. Uh, we do that all the time. Man, when I preach, I want to see at least 30 people get saved. Every Sunday, I'm thinking that. I'm thinking at least 500 people are going to show up every Sunday. I just have that in my mind. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm expecting big things from God. I pray for big things from God. But friend, if we look at results all the time, friend, you'll be very discouraged in your Christian walk. Very discouraged. And in fact, God, listen, God's not all about the big things sometimes. The spectacular things is what we like. We like a good tent meeting with five, 6,000 people. People running around the tent, jumping a few. And I'll probably be one of them because I get excited with those things. There's nothing wrong with that. But what happens when the tent folds up and goes to the next town and the fire goes out, where's everybody at then? I've seen it hundreds of times. When the fire goes out, people just, uh, when the hooping and the hollering is done with, uh, and when the uh, emotions are gone, uh, and when the thrill of victory comes in, suddenly the agony of defeat comes in, and it just wipes them out. Where are you going to be at when the fire goes out? What are we looking for? Notice what he was looking for. I believe he went to Mount Or I believe he went to Mount Sinai to regain some of that glory, don't you? Uh, some people believe he was the exact place where uh, Moses was when Moses was in the cleft of the rock and the glory of the Lord came by Sinai. Maybe Elijah thought, man, maybe I can get back over there to Mount Sinai and get up in there like Moses got. And maybe God will, will do big things again like He did with Moses. Maybe I can get some of that glory back. Maybe I can feel better about myself again. And so he travels over there to Mount Sinai. And he hides out there in that cave. And sure enough, the earthquake came. You want something big, an earthquake's pretty big. The wind was renting the rocks. And the, the earth was splitting open. And fire was, and lightnings were coming by. Just like uh, the days of Moses. But both those things, the Bible says, God wouldn't end. <laughs> Uh, we think God's got to be in something big if God's going to show up. But God, He likes the little things too. You know? And I find that in my life, it's the little things down through the years that God's been in. Right. Yeah. That sustained me, that's kept me, that's kept me going, that's moved me. The little things. But we like the big things. And we certainly love it in the time that we live in. Everything's big now. The bigger the better. The small things. You remember the illustrations of this all through the Bible. You remember when they came back uh, from the captivity. And, and you may recall this. Uh, they rebuilt the temple uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had tore down. And when they rebuilt it, it was kind of a... just eh, it wasn't much to it, you know. I mean, the temple of Solomon's temple was the greatest wonder in all the world. It was the greatest structure that had ever been built. It was laid with gold and silver. It was as if it was nothing in the time of Solomon. And when they built it, it says the elders, uh, people were uh, chanting in hallelujah, but the elders looked at it. The Bible says the elders, they got down and they wept about it. 
because they'd seen the former glory of that big temple. And they'd seen this little building going up. And they said, man, this ain't getting on a whole lot. What happened to the big? We wanted the big temple. We wanted God to do something big in our midst. Zechariah 4.10 says this. Zechariah came on the scene and said this to him from God. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. With those seven, and they are the eyes of the Lord, who went to and fro through the whole earth. And that might not make sense to you. Zechariah came on the scene and he looked at those old timers weeping and complaining about this new building and said, How come y'all despise the small things? He says, Don't you think I, you, what's more important to you, the God of this building or just the building? Is what he was saying. See, you despise these little things, but he said, I'm going to show you something that I can do with what little that you have. That's what he specialized in. Remember the widow's mock? Such a small portion, wasn't it, compared to everybody else. The Pharisees were throwing in a whole lot of money, and people were coming by and tithing a whole lot of money. And the woman, this widow came in and threw in this little mite. In uh, today's money, it's worth about a half a penny. It's not even a penny. And Jesus walked. He said, wow. She gave all she had. He doesn't despise the little things. He loves the little things. Five loaves and two fishes, that's pretty small. That's a little something when you're trying to feed all those people, right? The God said, I'll take the little thing and make something out of it. Elijah got his mind off the little things and wanted to see big things. And God said, you know what, I'm in the little whisper. That's what that word means. And that still small voice, you know what that is? That's a whisper. It's just a whisper. I thank God when he just whispers sometimes to me, you know? And then not only do we get frustrated, not only does fear come in, and failure, and all those things when we see the fire die out, but we lose focus, don't we? Oh boy, we can lose focus. What is it they call it? The kids got now ADD, is that what's coming? I still got that. I mean, you know, it's just hard. We just can't focus. We're on from one thing to the other. We're a little bit here, and then our focus is taken over there, and we're, you know, we're onto this and this new thing, and it never ceases to end. There's something new, there's something better. Our focus turns from that to this, to this, to that. That's what happens to life. He just lost his focus. You know how I know he lost his focus? Because twice God asked him, What doest thou here, Elijah? In other words, he said, Elijah, what are you doing, and why are you here? So I don't believe Elijah was in the place where God wanted him. He lost focus. And he said, what are you doing here? Why are you here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Sometimes he asked us that. Why are we here? What are we doing? What's our focus? Have I lost my focus for God? Have I lost my purpose for God? And Elijah's answer is very telling, isn't it? Did you get that? Let me read that to you again. 1 Kings 19, 14, when he answered him, he said, I have been. Did you see that? He said, I have been. Very jealous. I have been in the choir. I, have, I used to be. You know, Elijah has become one of the greatest men that ever walked the face of the earth and become a has-been. You know what that is, right? I used to be. You ever met one of those folks? I used to go to church over there. I used to be in the choir. I, I, I used to be over there on the deacon board. I, I used to be on, on that serving in VBS. I used to be. I used to be. That's what we're saying. Especially, you know, about nominating to me at the time, right? <laughs> you call the people around and see if people do something. They say, well, I, 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 let me pray about that. I used to do that, you know. Used to be. I don't have many here say, you know, I used to be on fire for God. But you know, the fire died out. I just got kind of discouraged. And, and, you know, I had some things going on in my life. And I got fearful and fatigued and frustrated. And I, I just lost my focus. And I just went where I wasn't supposed to go. And, and, and now God this morning is saying, where are you at? Where exactly are you at in life? 
What exactly are you doing? What would your answer be? I used to be God. I have been. That's what Elijah was. Does that happen to a man like Elijah? Don't you think that could happen to a man like me? I mean, just think about it. I used to be. Used to be. Used to be. Used to be. I said, I used to be. I want to have any of us in here this morning say, you know what I used to be? Oh, I used to be on fire for the Lord. What are you doing with your life? Where are you at this morning? I wonder if we can just stand. Grab our hymn books and turn to page 550. Softly and tenderly. I'm going to pick that out. That's fitting. Still small voice. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling this morning. Number 550. As we sing a few verses, maybe God's asking you, what really, what, where are you? Where are you, Grandma? What are you doing? Why are you stuck in a cave out right here? Fearful and frustrated. I've got no work for you to do. I've got a commission on your life. My hand is on you. You need to get out of that cave. You need to get back doing what you're supposed to be doing. Being where you're supposed to be. I wonder if there'd be one here this morning. So you know what I just... And I just need a touch from God. I need His hand back on me. I'm getting fearful and frustrated. I'm hitting the end of my road. I'm, I'm, I'm hitting the wall. I'm, I'm, I've been finished for a while. I just don't seem like I can go on another step. Maybe you've isolated yourself from others and from God. You're hiding in the cave. You've been sleeping under the juniper tree. You've been making excuses. God this morning is asking you, where are you at? What are you doing? Get back relationship with Jesus Christ. Get back in the grind. Get back in the game. Just because the fire has died out doesn't mean God's relating to you for what you need to be doing. Maybe you're left this morning. Maybe you're lost in here this morning. You're not used to me, but you know that you never have been. And you need to get saved. And you need to get right with God. Today is a day of salvation. You come if you need to come. I'd love to share with you a few verses. Pray with you. The Lord's more willing for you to be saved than to get saved. You come in. It's so big the universe can't contain it, but it's so small it will come right into your home, right into the temple, right into your heart.
and you find our trust and our faith in you, Lord, in all things. I pray, Lord, we look to you. Lord, we thank you for your help, the grace that you give upon us, Lord. I pray that you would just touch your soul today. If there is one who don't know you as Savior, Lord, they would come to knowledge and truth, Lord, through that still, small voice, Father. We love you and we thank you, Father. So you guide and direct us throughout our week. We give you all the honor and glory and praise in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.